Uh, thank you, Nicholas, for hosting this session, and uh, thank you for the intro. Um, also, I would like to thank Professor Ren Chie Chen for inviting me for the talk. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Since I don't know where you are, good morning, good afternoon, and maybe good evening. Um, I was a researcher at Microsoft Research Asia when I was invited. Uh, currently, I work as a senior research uh, scientist at Tai Chi Graphics. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, different body simulations. Since Renjie told me that the audience here in graduate school at SPP are mostly college students and the young researchers, I will start from the basis of a simulation and talk about some acceleration schemes utilizing geometric information, um, including projected dynamics and some follow-ups. Um, I like video games. That's the main reason I started my research in computer graphics. Here's uh, a game I used to play when I was a kid and I played it three years ago on Nintendo Switch. The same virtual character looks much better than it used to be thanks to the advanced render techniques. Uh, to me, computer graphics is a lot of fun because it always deliver realistic feedbacks to me, not only about how I see, uh, but also about how I feel when I interact with the virtual world. There are a lot of things I can poke in this world to feel and what they are. And I believe simulation techniques will be the next key to boost our virtual experience. Oops. I know we are in SGP right now, uh, and you may wonder how geometry processing is related to physically based simulations. In this talk, I will cover the key ideas we have been using to accelerate our simulation, utilizing the geometric information of the simulated object. I will cover not only the works from our group, but also some excellent simulation papers from other research groups too, um, as long as they form into the same line of research on simulating deformable models. Here on the left, there is a statue of a, of a Stanford dragon in the real world. Thanks to many geometry processing techniques, we can now capture, reconstruct, mesh, edit, deform, and parameterize the model in a virtual world like the one shown on the right. And a physically based simulation does one step further and uh, enables us to interact with the model virtually. Simulating a deformable object is hard because unlike a rigid body, which can only translate and rotate, and a different body has many more degrees of freedom. Um, where every vertex here can move freely in space, making the entire object you know, deformable. In order to simulate a different body, we need some basis to describe the force caused by deformation and the law to integrate the deformation force into motion. And respectively, we need to discretize both of them to fit into our discrete virtual simulation pipeline. Let's first see how we describe the deformation and measure the elastic energy of the force or the force. Uh, the simplest approach to do this is to use a mass spring system, which is by default already a discrete system. When we get something deformable, we first denote it as a set of vertices with mass. We connect the nearby vertices with springs, and uh, since every spring wants to go back to its original length, a mass spring system has, has a tendency to recur recover the deformed model, deform deformed model into its rest pose. So in that case, describing the deformable model of, um, of the object is equivalent to describing the deformation of the springs. Apparently, the deformation of the spring is the difference between its current lens and the rest lens. According to Hooke's law, we can also define the potential energy stored in a spring as a square of its deformation times one half of its stiffness. Once we have the energy, we can compute the spring force as a negative gradient of the elastic energy. Um, well, that's all. That's all we need to know to simulate uh, the, the deformation about the mass spring model, right? And how about a continuous deformable solid? Well, in that case, we can for sure start with a continuous model where the deformation is described by a super complicated function called deformation map. The func this function maps the material space position uh, uppercase x to a deformable, to a deformed position in lowercase x. The deformation map can be sometimes really simple in trivial cases. For instance, this phi can be just the x plus some translation vector t in a translation, in a pure translational deformation. 
And the flight can be some rotation matrix times x in a rotational motion, or uh, some scaling matrix s times x in a uniformly stretching motion. In complicated cases, we can always define the deformation gradient, deformation map in infinitesimal regions. And since the region is small, we can further approximate the deformation map by linearizing it into an affine transformation of x. Once we have the deformation map, we can use a map to define the energy density function around every infinitesimal regions. Recall that phi is an affine transformation to x. We have this phi as the deformation, uh, as the energy density function. Um, it could also be the function to the affine transformation of x as well. Since the energy density function should be rigid body transformation invariant, we have psi being a function that depends solely on f right now, where this f is a deformation gradient, uh, is a gradient of the deformation map, and is therefore called deformation gradient. Now, what should the energy density function look like? Uh, we can make an analogy of the mass point system to write some candidates. Well, they are not very useful because uh, the left one penalized every deformation gradient other than identity, which include rotational motions. And the right one is rotational invariant indeed, but it simply wants to shrink every deformation gradient into zero, which will not likely to be a good candidate to describe the energy density. The reason why we can't have those nicely formed energy density using deformation gradient itself is because the deformation gradient is not the best quantity to describe deformation. We know that it contains rotation as well. So we want to have a better descriptor to describe deformation, which we call strain. A strain is used to describe the deformation, uh, but nothing else. It needs to be rigid body transformation invariant, um, and it should be zeroed in the rest of pose. There are some strain tensors in different constitutive models, such as the grain strain tensor in the STPK model, um, and another tensor, which is the Hermitian part of the deformation gradient minus the identity matrix in co-rotated linear elasticity model. Now, after we have the deformation strain, we can simply set the energy density as a square of our deformation, like we did in the mass spring system. Or even better, we can um, append an extra term to penalize the change of the size as shown on the right. In order to run the simulation, we will only need uh, to take a derivative of this energy density psi function. We need to have the gradient of psi, uh, which stands for the force. We can apply the chain rule to compute this. For hyperelastic materials, the, the term d psi df is now called the, the first piola kirchhoff stress, stress tensor, indicating uh, the quote-unquote stress force applied on, on the deformation gradient space. Here are some examples of the PK1 tensors for STDK materials and the corot material. Um, here, you don't need to understand the computation right now, um, but I would just like to include them here to make the slide self-contained. You can always check this later. Previously, we have defined the energy density using infinitesimal regions. Um, we can integrate it, of course, into the energy of the entire deformable blob. We would require, then it will require us to perform a spatial discretization eventually. One of the po most popular assumptions is the linear element assumption. Once we have the tessellated mesh, no matter it's a tet mesh or hex mesh in 3D or a triangle or pot mesh in 2D, um, we can assume that the deformation inside one element is always affine, or uh, the deformation gradient inside one element is always constant. Given that linear element assumption, we can describe the energy simply as the summation from each element weighted by the size of the elements. Now, eventually, uh, we have the elastic energy defined using linear F again. Uh, the only thing left, like we did for the mass spring system, is to compute the gradient and, and compute the gradient of the energy to evaluate the force. The assembly of the gradient is a bit tricky because it depends on your tessellation model. Um, you can check the for fmdefo.org for more details. Or if your tool supports auto diff, you can also rely on it to compute your gradient. 
After having the energy and the force for the deformables, we can always use them to run a simulation. We now know that the acceleration is the time derivative of the velocity, and the velocity is the time derivative of the position. Um, and the mighty Newton's law of motion connects the force we have with the motion using F equals to MA. Note that we only care about the position and velocity of the moving object in certain time knots because we don't have infinite computational resources to keep track of all the continuous moving object. We first uh, turn the derivative forms into an integration form, assuming that we know all the quantities until the, the current time Tn. And uh, now what we know for our simulation um, is to compute what will happen for the next time tm plus one. However, since we do not know everything and after time tn, this integration becomes impossible for us to evaluate. Now, what should we do? One way to simplify this is to evaluate in, in the integration from the known end, assuming the quantities are not changed during the small time step. This is called explicit or forward Euler integration. This forward Euler is extremely fast, but it will also increase the system energy gradually. So it is seldom used uh, for the existence of the symplectic Euler integration that we will mention after. The symplectic Euler simply swaps the order of the update and uses the updated velocity to update the position. Um, it remains in the explicit form. It is as fast as forward Euler and it, even better, it is momentum preserving. It has an oscillate. Um, it has an oscillating system Hamiltonian. Hence, it is often the explicit integration method we use. And uh, implicit order, on the other hand, also assumes the quantities are not changed during the time step, but it uses the future values to set up the equations of motion. If we substitute the first equation into the second one. We can see that the implicit Euler is a nonlinear root finding problem. We can promote this root finding problem to an optimization problem G and then solve this problem using Newton's method. Now note that, that uh, the implicit Euler is often expensive. During the nonlinear optimization, we need to very frequently linearize it and solve it using Newton iterations. Um, it also damps the Hamiltonian of the system um, from time to time, especially for the oscillating components. But um, it is often stable for large time steps, and that's why it is widely used in performance-centric applications, such as games, MR, design, or animations. To wrap it up, as long as we know the deformation energy, we can always run an explicit or implicit integration to simulate the deformed bodies in time. Usually the explicit integration costs less per frame, but need more frames to be stable. Uh, the implicit integration costs much more per frame, but allows much, much larger time steps and uh, lower frame numbers. Usually it is easier to reduce the cost winning a single frame compared to enlarge the time step sizes due to, due to the CFL conditions. So we often pick the implicit scheme to run real time applications. As we mentioned previously, now um, let's focus on the implicit integration. This implicit integration can be as simple as something like this. We first feed the current state as the initial gas to an optimization framework, and then the optimization framework spit out the next state for us. We keep iterating the states and finally get an animation. To solve the optimization problem, a successive linearization is always needed. Uh, making the main bottleneck of the most simulations. We can for sure rely on classic Newton's method to run this, to, to run this solution. Given our potential G as an, and, uh, uh, an initial gas X, we can evaluate the gradient and the curvature around it. So the descent direction will be a direction that directly points us to the bottom of that Newton valley. But is Newton's method a good solution for real-time applications? That depends. That depends on the optimization problem itself. Now, our problem is a combination of a very nice quadratic problem on the left, hand side, on the left and a not so good elastic potential on the right. 
the elastic potential is almost always nonlinear. And is sometimes even worse, it could be non-convex, making Newton's method a slow numerical choice. Why it can be a non-convex one? Let's consider a simple 2D problem consists of two springs. Excuse me. These two springs share a common vertex at the rest, um, and the rest of them are attached to the walls. If we move one vertex along this t-axis, uh, we can plot the spring energy as follows. It has two global minima, where both springs are at their rest lenses, and one local maximum, representing an unstable equilibrium. Depending on where you start, Newton's method may even give you an ascent direction. And we have to do some definite efforts to correct this direction. So now we've got an idea that our problem is hard. Um, it is a large nonlinear problem, and we don't know how to deal with it other than using Newton's method for now. But at least we know what kind of problems we would like to see. Um, we would like to see linear problems because they are always welcome, uh, since we only need to solve one linear system at once, and then we will have a solution. Nonlinear problems are not so friendly unless they're small. Uh, but can we separate our original problem into these kinds of new problems? The answer is yes. Let's start from a mass spring system for now. The energy of a spring um, is given by Hooke's law, which increases quadratically with the difference uh, between the current spring length and its rest length. The nonlinearity here is just a hidden inside the length of the spring where there's a little square root takes place. We can therefore localize this nonlinearity by reformulating spring energy uh, by introducing an auxiliary variable P. This variable represents a vector whose length is the rest length of the spring, and it encodes the only nonlinearity of the spring energy. Once the endpoint of the spring is given, we can compute the best fit rotation or the P vector analytically. Note that computing P is a nonlinear problem indeed, since the ex existence of the square root, but we don't care about we don't care about it anymore uh, since it is so tiny. Once we sum up the elastic potentials of all the springs, we find that the, the original nonlinear problem becomes now quadratic in X and all the nonlinearity has been absorbed by the auxiliary variable P. The new system almost doubles the degrees of freedom because of our introducing um, of the auxiliary variable, but it has lots of nice properties. First, all the system matrices are now independent on X nor P. Now we can pre-compute them. If we fix X, it is really easy to solve for P because we just need to loop over all the strings and find their best fit directions. Know that those directions can be computed in parallel since X is fixed. If we fix P, it is also easy to solve for X because the entire system is quadratic in X. In fact, we can compute the analytical solution here. An even better thing is that the large linear system is state independent indicating that we can prefactorize the entire system for an even better acceleration. That invites us a local and global solver, where in the local step, and all the nonlinearities has been localized. We solve many, many small nonlinear problems to get the directions of the vector P. And in the global step, we only need to solve one large linear system to obtain X, where the system matrix can be prefactorized. Here are some examples. Um, for example, we can use the accelerated mass spring system to animate a brush or to shoot an elastic polymetric frog. So this is nice, um, but for volumetric models, it is still discretized using that, uh, mass spring systems. Can we generate this idea to uh, support continuous FDM models. And there goes the projective dynamics. If there's one thing we want to remember from this mass spring system, um, it will be the way that we localize the nonlinearity. After we introduce the auxiliary variable, 
the original system energy becomes a quadratic form, which can be seen as a distance between a discrete shape descriptor and its projection. Because in mass spring system, x1 minus x2, describe the length of and the rotation of the spring and therefore decide the state of that spring. And the variable p simply projects this shape descriptor onto the rest lens. That observation opens a new direction for us to bring this idea of localizing the nonlinearity to an FEM case. After the, a discussion, um, we gener generalized the framework called the projective dynamics to support more energy representations. For instance, we can change the shape descriptor to something else. A linear combination of the position is a perfect descriptor because it is equivalent to the deformation gradient of a tetrahedron. We can also change the manifold for projection as well, as long as we can define a distance function between the manifold and the shape descriptor. When choosing deformation gradient as the shape descriptor and SO3 as the target manifold, we can hope coherently simulate a thin sheet with different tessellations, taking advantage of the finite elements theory. We can also project the deformation gradient to an SL3, which is a special linear group with unit determinant to control the volume preservation property of the material. You can also use the Laplace Beltrami operator to compute the mean curvature and project it to a rotated rest pose curvature vector to measure a bending energy. To summarize, the key idea of projective dynamics is still the localization of the system nonlinearity. The only difference between projective dynamics and the previously mentioned mass spring systems is a different shape descriptor and more choices of the target manifolds. When group everything together, we are able to use projective dynamics to simulate a 43K constraints um, at real time frame rate. Here, the house um, was enclosed in a freeform deformer. The grasses and trees and clothes are all deformables as well. Now we have PD, projective dynamics, to simulate a certain type of quadratic deformable materials. Can we also generalize it to support more nonlinear materials in the real world? One alternative view of projective dynamics is a quasi-Newton method. The original incremental potential can be reformed uh, with our auxiliary variable P here. But if we treat P as an implicit function of X and minimize it together with X, it will give us back the, the original nonlinear problem. Let's compute the gradient of this problem GX using chain rule first. The first part of the gradient is nice and clean and also somewhat familiar. But the second part contains a tensor, which is the derivative of PX over X. Um, it looks intimidating. What can we do about it? Well, turns out we don't need to do anything about it since the second part is always zero. To geometrically understand this, let's recall the meaning of the auxiliary variable P. It is a projection, right? So any perturbation along the line of the transpose X minus PX will not change the position of PX. Or in the other word, uh, delta PX is perpendicular to G transpose X minus PX turning the second part of the, this derivative to be zero. That is great. Now we can further uh, let multiply the inverse of matrix M divided by H squared plus L to both sides of the equations, which will give us something that we already knew. It turns out that the analytical solution of the global step X star in projective dynamics is simply the current state X minus a filtered gradient direction. And we can use the same filter matrix to simulate different materials. The only thing we need to do is to change the gradient. This is to say that the projective dynamics is nothing but just a quasi Newton method. Um, unlike Newton's method, which filters the gradient direction using the inverted Hessian matrix, projective dynamics simply chooses the Hessian approximation to compute the descent direction. This is a very special Hessian approximation where the second order derivative of the elastic energy is replaced by the system Laplacian matrix. 
This descent method is also sometimes referred as a sub of gradient descent method. Treating it, treating projective dynamics as a quasi-Newton method enables us to simulate a variety of different materials without the requirement of using specific quadratic energy form. For instance, we can simulate this ditto model with co-rotated linear elasticity on St. Minya Kirchhoff or Neohoki material at similar cost. We are also able to simulate some user-defined materials using these splines without any problem. And we can further accelerate it using some, textbook, using some textbooks method, such as LBFGS. We construct a test case of a closed simulation by holding the left hand and shading, shaking the right hand. Right hand, sorry. Uh, both our method and the projected dynamics are running 10 iterations per frame at similar cost. Um, and you can see after the LBFGS acceleration shown in the middle, the simulation resembles the exact solution on the bottom one while vanilla projective dynamics on top damps the motion more when not converged well. Even in a non-contrived case like this closed simulation, the, converge, the convergence artifact of projective dynamics will be reflected in high-frequency components as well. Um, if you see the wrinkles highlighted in the red circles, LBFGS acceleration produces better wrinkles. So now, um, as we mentioned, the, the key idea of PD is to group all the nonlinearities into the local, uh, is to localize all the nonlinearities. But where the nonlinearity go in this formulation? Using projected dynamics as a quasi Newton method will give us a descent direction like this. The nonlinearity of the objective is fully considered in the gradient direction, but will be ignored in the approximated Hessian approximation. In fact, the Hessian approximation we used in PD can be seen as the exact Hessian when we fix the projection variable P. Since this approximation is applied to the projection variable, uh, we can also think of the Hessian as some special forms as shown on the right, which simply wants to vanish the shape descriptor. That's why it does not care about the current state, because no matter where the element is and how it is deformed, the Hessian wants to pull it to zero uh, with a constant quadratic energy. In some good cases where the elastic energy has almost the linear string stress curves and moderate stiffness, <laughs> projected dynamics can produce very nice results, like the one shown in this Christine Borrow example with as rigid as possible model. Otherwise, uh, the red curve will flat out earlier, choking the convergence of the behaviors if you're running in a really nonlinear material or with uh, super high stiffness. Of course, waiting for projective dynamics to convergence is not a good idea. And I personally also will switch to Newton-like method if I really want an extreme accurate solution. But projective dynamics, nevertheless, provide a plausible initial guess in almost no time. The, 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 the battleground of PD itself is almost always within the real-time regime. Um, if we want to simulate a super accurate simulation, we can at least use it to bootstrap the Newton. There are also some uh, very similar ideas with projected dynamics in geometry processing applications as well. Um, for example, one can use Laplacian matrix to run a quasi-Newton simulation in parameterization problems too. For example, the accelerated quadratic pro proxy in SIGGRAPH 2016 does exactly the same. And also the scalable locally injected mapping paper in SIGGRAPH 2017 also uses a Laplacian approximation to replace the Newton method if the simulation starts from a very bad initial guess from the exact solution. Uh, let's get back to simulations. Another group of researchers view projective dynamics as a very special case of ADMM. Since this is a line of a good research, I'd like to talk about it here as well. The key idea of ADMM or alternating direction method of multipliers is to break a unconstrained optimization problem on into an, a finally constrained one by introducing an auxiliary variable here. For instance, if the original problem is as simple as this one to minimize x squared plus x, one, x minus one square, uh, we can formulate it into ADMM framework using a constraint one as x one, sorry, as to minimize x squared plus z squared 
such that x minus c equals to one. Once we have such kind of reformulation, we can solve the entire problem using the following way. It alternates the solver for two primal variables, x and z, and it will update the, the Lagrange multiplier variable u at the end of every iteration. In projective dynamics, we represent the elastic energy as a square distance between some shape descriptor as shown here. And the energy is simply the distance between this shape descriptor and its projection. This gives us a natural separation of the variables. We can represent the shape descriptor gx as the auxiliary variable d, and the original problem becomes an unconstrained optimization problem. Sorry, it becomes a constrained optimization problem G of X and Z um, subject to that Z is always a linear function of X. We can therefore update projective dynamics using those ADMM update rule. We first run the global step with a fixed Z to solve all X, where this row parameter is simply the weight for every element. And then we can run the local step with a fixed x to solve for d, where this easy is an indicator function, which will only be zero if the distance between d uh, and its projection is zero. And uh, this easy will be infinitely large otherwise. It is a local step because every element has an independent d. At last, we update the Lagrange multiplier um, in the ADMM framework. In PD, this Lagrangian is always zero because gx and z are always the same. But ADMM opens surely a different direction of view to this problem. We can for sure using different E functions to represent different nonlinear materials. And here's an example simulated using ADMM. As we can see, uh, we can dynamically add or remove attachment constraints. Um, and we can interact, interact with this uh, Amadillo model in real time. The good thing about uh, this ADMM kind of view is that it supports more type of materials because you can simply modify the E energy in the pipeline. And it is simple to implement as it needs no line search routines as well. But the convergence of ADMM highly dependent um, on the hyperparameter role as well. Dynamically changing this row parameter is highly recommended for better convergence, especially, uh, for example, in collision scenarios. But changing this row also requires a refactorization, degrading the performance gain from the PDADMM framework. There is another team of researchers views projective dynamics as a fixed point iterations and proposes their way to accelerate the convergence. As we know, the key of projective dynamics includes a local and a global step. And combining them together will give us a nonlinear function G. The iterations of PD will apply the G functions to the initial gas X0 again and again to convergence. So we can treat this G as a fixed point operator and denoting F as a residual function. The goal is to reduce the residual function to zero as quick, quickly as possible. We see that the original PD only uses information of the previous iterations one at a time. So one accelerating strategy similarly to LBFPS is to utilizing the history information to accelerate the convergence. The strategy is called Anderson acceleration and the goal is to find a better x tilde, uh, which is some linear combination from xk plus one minus j to xk plus one. The goal of Anderson acceleration is to reduce the residual as much as possible. But now, uh, since g is a nonlinear function in the weight parameter alpha, and solving this problem is not easy. To approximately solve it, we can further define another g tilt function, which linearly combines alpha with g axis instead of axis itself, so that reducing the modified residual becomes a least square problem size to f here. 
uh, you can also visualize this on Anderson acceleration with this example. When given a set of history points from xk minus two to xk plus one, we can first apply the fixed point operator G to them. We linearly combine the G axis and run, an, uh, run a least square problem to compute the best weight alpha to minimize the distance between G tilt, X tilt, and X tilt. And finally, we set X tilt at the corrected position and compute G X tilt for the next iteration. This Anderson acceleration provides a nice insight of projected dynamics and is proven to be effective in accelerating the convergence of PD. Um, let's get back to the bigger picture of implicit time integration of the deformed body simulation and projected dynamics. The bottleneck, as we mentioned before, is always the linear solve AX equals to B. And the base of projected dynamics is to, um, and its follow up is to set the prefactorization of the system matrix. Heavily relying on this prefactorization, projective dynamics is not working too well in parallel computing hardware. For example, in this octopus example with 0.1 million tetrahedra, 20 PD iterations will cost around one second per frame. Why? Uh, well, because the key of projective dynamics is the approximation of the Heschel matrix. Although hurting the long time convergence, PD is able to produce very fast responses due to its prefactorization. But however, the factors of extremely large linear systems are really memory consuming um, because factors usually have more than 10 times as non zeros compared to the original sparse matrix. And it is hard to perform forward and backward substitution in parallel. Stationary iterative solvers can be a solution when we want to scale the simulation up. This linear solver uh, can, <clears throat> sorry, this linear iterative solvers uh, will work as long as the spectral radius of M inverse N is less than one. And depending on the decomposition of the system matrix A, we can always have a Jacobi style iteration or like a gauss seidel style iteration solver. For example, uh, Hua Ming Wang proposed an accelerated iterative solver for project dynamics using Chebyshev semi-iterative approaches. And Marco Fretton-Chegali and the colleagues proposed an efficient coloring algorithm to solve the global step of projected dynamics using a parallelizable gauss seidel solver called Vivaci. Those algorithms are very efficient running on parallel computing hardware. For instance, when we apply in the same octopus model, this method have pretty good, uh, behave pretty good in real-time response. However, since these stationary iterative solvers are notorious at reducing the fre low frequency errors, they will make the simulated object softer or stretchier um, if not converging well, like this set here, uh, octopus. We can therefore resort to a multi-grid solver for the rescue. The key idea of the multigrid is to only solve a linear system very crudely using Jacobi or gauss seidel iterations, which are referred as smoothers, and it passes the residual to coarser levels to be further smoothed. Then the coarse level passes the correction back to the finer levels, and we do some extra post smoothing to the system to get an approximated solution. We investigated several multigrid schemes and found that a galaxy multigrid is a pleasant point for departure because it is really simple to set up. It works for any meshes and any restriction and pro or prolongation schemes. It also handles boundary conditions automatically. It just does not work super well with trivial picks of the U matrices. We will see how we use uh, a group that finds transformation matrices to make it work. To build this, we first uniformly sample the coarser level vertices from finer levels using the farthest point sampling. 
and then we want to build the an interpolation scheme that can be used to pass the information between levels. As we know, uh, this U is an interpolation matrix that determines two things. First, it decides the degrees of freedom of the course level nodes or um, what, what kind of information do we want to interpolate. And the second, it decides the interpolation weight, which is how we do the interpolation. The key ideas of our method answer these two questions exactly. To be more specific, we allow course level nodes to move in higher dimensional coordinates, and we use piecewise constant weights. We first lift the degrees of freedom of the course level node from three to 12, um, which lies in an affine transformation space. We call it scanning space coordinates because we were inspired by uh, Jacobson and Colley's paper, Fast Automatic Scanning Transformations. The space encodes the more general ge geometrically meaningful information, such as scaling, sharing, linearized rotation, and translation compared to the original tra traditional positional space. And we find it particularly useful to cut down the size of the course grid more aggressively, typically an order of magnitude smaller. And the second thing we want to do um, is to decide the interpolation weight between the two resolutions. Here we use piecewise constant weight, which is very counterintuitive. Uh, why? Well, we actually tried smooth weight at first, but they have problems. Let's say there are two nodes, V1 and V2, at the fine level, where this V1 is smoothly controlled by N force level nodes, uh, as shown in red. And V2 is controlled by M course level nodes, as shown in blue. Any edge between this V1 and V2 in a fine level which is one single non-zero entry in the A matrix, will end up with M by M non-zeros in the course level matrix U transpose AU. This is very common to see in un unstructured meshes, making the sparsity of the course level matrices much worse than it should be. And those non-zeros will be passes further into deeper levels, causing many issues in memory footprint. You can see this problem more clearly in an, an actual matrix with 117K rows and columns and the 10.4 non zeros per row on average. This is our fine level matrix. When interpolated using smooth weight, the coarse level matrix, which has only 4.K rows and columns, will have on average 193 non zeros per row. And our choices of piecewise constant weights will reduce the number to 37. Notice that this is only a two grid V cycle as a toy case. When you pass the non zeros into a denser and denser course level matrices using smooth weight, it will hurt the performance of a course level a lot. While our choice of piecewise constant weights will end up with more than 20 times faster compared to smooth ones in a big V cycle. Uh, but what do we lose? There's no free lunch, right? Piecewise piecewise constant interpolation is supposed to be bad at scanning at least, right? Well, let's see how bad it is. Let's say this blue thing is our fine level mesh being controlled by only two green dots at the course level node. If we move one dot or one node upward, a smooth weight, a smooth weighting scheme with linear blending looks okay-ish on top while the piecewise constant weights simply tear it apart. But we find that the cliff caused by piecewise constant weights is not that bad. Uh, the error it created compared to the exact solution looked like an impulse function, which is extremely high frequency. Remember that high frequency errors are easy to be removed when applied with some smoother, such as Jacobi or Gaussido. We observed that piecewise constant weights might be bad at skinny, but they are acceptable in multi-grid framework. As a result, we choose to stick with this piecewise constant weighting strategy. Because this one is a key to maintain the sparsity pattern of our course level matrices without causing too much troubles, 
And moreover, it also enables us to update multi-resolution system matrices efficiently when the finest level matrix A has changing numbers. Therefore, we can support collisions better. Like for example, we can run a Newton's method for closed simulation with 0.4 springs at real time. It can handle dynamic matrix changes uh, caused by the nonlinearity of the mass spring and also the collisions as well, generating this vivid encodes. And to visually test the scalability of this method, uh, we can also simulate a hanging armadillo with the same material but different resolutions, and they look quite similar. We plot the memory cost in the red graph and the time cost in blue one and in a log log scaled plot where the x axis is the number of tetrahedra. This green line is a line with a slope equals to one, indicating a linear behavior. We see that the memory cost of our multigrade scales linearly, and the performance scales better than linear initially with the help of parallelization, and it will eventually convert to linear for large meshes. We also visualize this kind of difference. Um, here, we simulate the, the octopus by projected dynamics with different solving strategies. The top left is the ground truth produced by prefactorized. Um, <coughs> <clears throat> produced by prefactorized matrices in vanilla PD. The top right one is using our multi-grid solver, which resembles a ground truth solution a lot. And the bottom two, as we've seen before, are Chebyshev and Vivachi shop, where we here also in the Chebyshev and Vivachi shop, we fine tune the simulation parameters to, um, to their best performance here. With our method as the backbone of projected dynamics, we can interact with a deformable dragon with 0.7 million elements at around 40 frames per second. To summarize, we have seen a bunch of papers today right now. Some of them are from our group and some of them are not, but they form a very nice line of research works in simulating different bodies in real time. We first see how we generalize this idea uh, from fast mass spring system to projective dynamics, which is a generalization on discrete models. Then we see two different point of views of PD supporting more general nonlinear materials, one using quasi Newton and another using ADMF. We also see that quasi Newton view of PD can naturally accelerate the convergence of PD using LBFGS. And viewing PD as a fixed point iterations also brings the Anderson acceleration as well. To improve the scalability of projected dynamics using GPU, people also try different iterative solvers such as Chebyshev or parallel gauss seidel on and or unstructured multigrid techniques. Well, is there anything to take away today? We started this talk from projected dynamics, and we see that the key of projected dynamics is to localize the nonlinearities using the local and the global steps. How can we extract those nonlinearities? We need a pre computed system matrix approximation using topological information. This kind of indicates that geometry, the geometry of a deformable object can be a piece of very effective information to accelerate the simulation. We use the scanning subspace to stack the galaxy multigrid. It also indicates that the classic geometry processing algorithms can be used as a building block in accelerating schemes for physically based simulations. And finally, if we look all the way back to the optimization problem we use to run the simulation, the difficult part is always on the elastic energy side. If we get rid of the good looking quadratic inertia term, the optimization problem becomes a quasi static simulation, which is very similar to conventional geometry processing problems. It should be possible to apply the acceleration schemes in physically based simulation to geometry processing problems. Or um, to me, even better, I'd like to see apply those ac acceleration schemes the other way around from geometry processing problems to physically based simulators. 
I hope this talk can trigger more exchanges in technical ideas between simulation and the geometry processing problems. Um, here are some of the code available on my website. You can check it and play with them. Um, and I am ready to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tian for the uh, note for the talk. We have uh, plenty of time for questions. Um, so, uh, do we have questions in the audience? Uh, there are some discussion during the talk on Discord. If someone wants to uh, break some discussion with uh, Tian Tian, feel free to feel free to go. <coughs> Okay. Um, uh, yeah. So, um, so, Jonathan, what do you? Mm -hmm. what are the main challenges you 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 believe that? Um, will have to be taken in the next year as if, if I want to do a PhD in this field, what would be the, the topics I would have to work on? Uh, well, I think uh, the intrinsic algorithms between geometry processing and the physical effect and simulation has a lot uh, in common. So um, for example, I think for, uh, the, the fact that data accessing in geometry um, processing problems can be also used in physical basis simulation as well, uh, since sometimes the memory overhead can be even more compared to the computational overhead, especially if we migrate all the code into GPU. Uh, so if we have a very efficient data accessor, uh, like we used in geometry processing problems, um, we can possibly also apply it to physical basis simulations as well. Um, also, one thing that I am personally very interested in is to uh, use some data-driven algorithms to um, as a building block inside the uh, simulation project. Um, I personally don't really believe a end-to-end -end training or end-to-end uh, -end machine learning based algorithm to run the simulation. But uh, um, it is always a nice, nice, it will always be a nice try if we can apply some data driven knowledge uh, to, for example, set up a multi grid or to uh, set up a better inter interpolation or um, prolongation scheme. Um, so I, I believe that the line of research will also be very interesting to me. Okay. And um, so if we use deep learning algorithms, that are how will the uh, user interact with this kind of simulation? I and mean, um, we, we've seen many interactive approaches um, where the user can play with the simulation. Um, if you, if you, so the, what would be the goal of the of the deep learning? Just to speed up or to add more control or something like that? Yeah, I think uh, a, a speed up can be anticipated and. Uh, uh, well, although I don't believe it can fully replace the original pipeline of the simulation work, but uh, um, using them as uh, small building blocks is always appreciated. Uh, we have a question by Alec. Yeah. Hi, Tian Tian. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask about that. Uh, you had that slide where you're showing like the octopus falling, I think it was with two different multi-grid methods. Uh, let me see. The... It was like the Vivachi one in Chebyshev. Yeah, this slide, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, okay. What what was the Chebyshev one? I forgot. Oh, um, this one is a... Two, 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 two. 
This one is from the paper called uh, HIP Chef Semi Iterative Approach for Accelerating Projective Dynamics and Position Based <laughs> Dynamics. I Got actually it. have some sl slides about it. Let me uh, unhide it. <laughs> so, the, the, the key idea with my third is to start from a, a Jacob Jacobi iteration. For example, we can uh, use a diagonal, mat diagonal part of the A matrices to set up our M matrix. Um, and uh, as we know, the Jacobi iterations usually converge super slowly. Uh, so it will cause lots of artifacts if we just run, a, a, just to rely on Jacobi iterations to run the simulation. So the key idea of the Chebyshev one is to define also a better sequence using linear combinations of the history, like the Anderson acceleration did. Um, so for example, we can have some weight bj, uh, which comes which combines a history from j equals to zero to k uh, to form a better x tilt k and as a solution for the Chebyshev iteration. Um, one thing is that this weight needs to sum up to unity because when it converged, uh, we have a bunch of, uh, for example, from k, sorry, x k minus m to x k. And uh, um, after summing them up, we don't want to ruin the, the solution. And also in order to minimize the distance between this better version of x tilt k and the ground truth solution, we can set up to, 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 to this kind of minimization problem. And we know that the error is always uh, some polynomial of the matrix M inverse N multiplied by the original error uh, of E zero. And in order to minimize this polynomial, we can, th there's a theory that uh, the, the, it is equivalent to minimize this polynomial uh, with to maximize the, um, mac maximize the, the largest eigenvalues of the, the entire polynomial of lambda. Uh, where lambda is the largest eigenvalue, but we don't want to really compute it on the fly since uh, if we can compute the lambda of that system matrix, we can already solve the linear system already. Um, so instead of minimizing all the possible lambdas, uh, we can pick, <laughs> sorry, um, we can pick a Chebyshev polynomial to solve this problem. <laughs> and the by substituting the Chebyshev polynomial into, into the problem, it is actually very delightful to see that the, the overall cost uh, for every iteration is really, really small. Uh, all we need to do is to introduce an, an, actual, an actual variable omega uh, into our iterations, like this one, and use this omega to to the, the previous iteration, the results from the previous iterations uh, and to get a better new one. So uh, as we can see, this omega depends on the, the estimated uh, row, which is the spectral radius of the matrix. Um, so the good thing about the Chebyshev iterations, it, it converges really fast if you pick the right row, but um, and it will also diverge when uh, if you pick the wrong row. So, Usually when rho is approaching to one, you can get a better acceleration, uh, but also it prones to explosion. And if you set the rho to something closer to zero, the, the acceleration from Chebyshev iterations will almost uh, um, vanish. So a, a safe zone of this rho really depends on the material property and also uh, even worse on the simulation states. For example, if you collide with something, you probably want to um, downplay the rho a little bit to make a to make a, a stable simulation. But uh, uh, overall, I think it's, it's still a very nice strategy to use to accelerate all those, those Jacobi iterations. <laughs> okay, interesting. And uh, in, the, in the videos you were showing, both the methods kind of experience, it, it, like, are, 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 are they both wrong? Like, is they too soft or? Right, they are too soft. I mean, that if you um, allow more time for those methods to converge, um, it will be also stiffer. But oh, uh, um, right, if you terminate it too early, it will be stretchier than it, it's expected. Got it. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you.
Okay. Uh, we get another question from Igor Vajena. Hello. Uh, Hi. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask the, there is um, so sort of a separate um, branch of research stemming from position-based dynamics, which is the extended position-based dynamics, which uh, tries to address this problem with um, converging to an accurate uh, solution. And you can actually formulate it for, for say the STVK model pretty conveniently and it parallelizes well. Can you comment mm -hmm. on maybe any comparison between something like projective dynamics and XPD? Oh, so uh, that's a very good question. Um, XPVD is based on the, the uh, compliant constraint dynamics. And uh, the good thing about XPVD is that it does not really need to solve uh, for uh, any linear system because uh, you can just iterate all constraints one at a time and uh, uh, either use Jacobi iterations on top type of iterations. But the, the um, the, the key idea really in XPVD is still replace the linear solve of the short complement using Jacobi or Gauss-Side iterations. So um, the artifact of projected dynamics and XPVD, if, if neither of them are allowed to converge to the exact solution are different. On the projected dynamic side, you will damp more for the high frequency motions because the Jacobi matrix itself um, is not accurate enough, um, but uh, it will propagate all the translational information, all the low frequency information um, directly to the, uh, sorry, to the, uh, to the whole mesh immediately. So the artifact you will see is always on the high frequency part, but uh, in PBD or XPBD, if you do not converge the system well, you will see a stretch here um, animation, something very similar to, to this one, and um, showing in the screen right now. I see, thank you. Yeah, I think Wenji, you got your microphone up. Hi, Renjie, you need to unmute your microphone. I cannot hear you. Yeah. Sorry. There we uh, go. Thank you, Tian for your uh, great uh, lecture. So um, following the discussion uh, earlier with uh, Alec, uh, you mentioned that uh, the uh, chip shift uh, accelerator is um, related or similar to uh, the Anderson uh, acceleration approach. Uh, can mm -hmm. you uh, elaborate a little bit more on that? <laughs> sure. So. Uh, there are similarities between those two methods. Let me pull it back to the Anderson slide. So here, as we start the discussion from the Anderson acceleration, uh, we say that the original PD um, only uses the information of the previous iteration, the previous one iteration at a time. But uh, the Anderson acceleration is able to uh, utilizing the entire window of history and try to uh, uh, make this X tilt better. But uh, this better is different defined in these two problems. So in Anderson acceleration, and the, the problem is defined as a fixed point problem. And uh, since this now the G is a fixed point operator, um, it's quite easy to define what is better, the better thing um, that the better result is that uh, after you apply this G to this to this XK, you won't get any difference. Or if you have XK plus one, sorry, or it's not something like a G of XK minus XK equals to zero, uh, you already reached the, the, the ground truth solution. Um, and uh, as we mentioned before, the Anderson acceleration tries to um, linearize this problem, sorry, to, to define a slightly different problem. Um, the definition of the problem, instead of using alpha uh, inside this nonlinear function of G, we just uh, pull this alpha out to make it a linear problem to solve. And this is a really light weighted one um, so that people can plug it into the simulation. 
and the Chepi Chef one, on the other hand. There we go. It's trying to directly minimize the iterate of XK uh, with the ground truth solution in X star, which we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. So um, I, can, I can make the derivation slightly slower. I need to uh, memorize myself how to do this derivation. Okay, so we know that uh, uh, the, the weight in the Chebyshev approach has a, has a constraint. It needs to be summed up to unity. So the first step we can do is to um, and to multiply the summation of weight in front of x star at first. And in that case, um, we can uh, merge those weights together to minimize this xj minus x star uh, multiply all the ways in front of it. And uh, uh, since that we know that xj minus x star in a iterative solver uh, will end up with this kind of error. Mm -hmm. The error is simply the error in the first iteration multiplied by the matrix m inverse n uh, j times. So that as long as we can minimize this matrix multiple, uh, polynomial. We can minimize the distance between your case iterate, the modified case iterate, with the uh, to to the ground truth solution. So uh, since the uh, since the goal is different, the approach of the Chebyshev iteration and the Anderson uh, acceleration they are also different. And afterwards, uh, they just use the Chebyshev theory, the Chebyshev multi uh, polynomial to minimize this, uh, this matrix polynomial directly, approximately. Right. OK, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, I think I get uh, the gist of it. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you. So uh, another uh, more general question is that, um, uh, so uh, you, uh, uh, talked and explained uh, a few uh, works of yours. And I think to me, at least to me, uh, it takes, uh, because I'm more uh, I'm less familiar with um, simulation, uh, seems to, to uh, run or to implement uh, your uh, algorithm or your paper, it will take uh, a lot of effort. <laughs> And I think uh -huh. you, you have already released the uh, uh, code to some of your work. Maybe you should uh, try to uh, promote that. <laughs> oh, sh sure, yeah. Uh, this is actually one, one problem I also uh, think in our community because um, uh, usually mo mo most of the computer graphics applications are very hard for, um, and, uh, and everybody wants to use different linear solvers dependent on different libraries. And um, unlike those machine learning related projects, we can just pull out the code and written in PyTorch or TensorFlow um, and just run it in my computer with one click without any problem. Uh, this is actually part, part of the reason um, I, I joined a startup called Tai Chi Graphics because uh, uh, we do want to set up also something like the, the programming language uh, for computer graphics applications. So people can just uh, um, pour, pour some code from GitHub and uh, run it with Python style uh, in your compiler without any problem. That's very nice. Um, I think I will uh, look at the uh, Taj library or framework. Uh, it's very uh, friendly to uh, beginners. That's very nice work. Thank you for making the effort. Thank you. Thank you, Tanjan. So I think um, there is no more questions. So we can stop now. Of course, if, if you get more questions, you can ask Tanjan on, on, on Discord. Um, and uh, we'll have the next talk in uh, 45 minutes. So thank you again, Tanjan, and um, enjoy the work. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, Renjie. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye.